Welcome to the Rebooting Business Podcast, where we discuss how businesses can reboot, rebuild, and come back bigger and stronger than ever before in a post-COVID-19 reality. And now, here's your host, David Summerfleck. And hello. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Rebooting Business. I am your host, Digital marketing specialist extraordinaire, in my own humble opinion, David Summerfleck. This is episode 22, I believe. And today my guest is Shakina Johnson. Am I pronouncing everything correctly? Yes, you are. Thank you so much for taking the time to be my guest on this podcast today. Um, I'd like to start off with an introduction insofar as uh, your background, which I think is really interesting because uh, you have a background as a realtor, a paralegal, and a web designer, and I think a freelance writer too. Mm-hmm. So you've got a very interesting multifaceted background. I want to know more about that and how did you transition from one to the other to where you finally are? Okay. Um, well, first, thank you for having me today. I'm, I'm really excited to uh to do this with you. Thank you. Um, my background is, it is a little a little different. So I was on the law school track for such a long time, a long period of time. So I went through all the schooling possibilities, right? Because you got to have your bachelor's and um, yeah. all those other things. And um, I, I got to a point in my life where I decided I wasn't going to go to law school. And so I had to figure out what else I wanted to do. Um, and while I was in school, actually, I became a freelance writer because college students are poor, right? So yeah. we, I had to I had to figure out how to uh, make money for myself. And so I started doing something that I actually love, which is writing. And I, I did that as a side, on the side. And then while I was going to school and working, um, when I eventually found a job, um, I kind of transitioned to just being a full time, uh, either legal assistant or paralegal. And I, I've been in corporate, I was in corporate for about 12 or so years. And I realized uh, as a freelance writer at some point, I, I don't like writing for other people. <laughs> I, I, it takes the fun out of, yeah. it takes the enjoyment out of it. I don't want to have a deadline. I don't want to want you to tell me what topic I should be writing. I just wanted to, to write, right? I, I should have became a blogger. Well, you know, I worked at like, five or six different marketing agencies over the course of like 20 odd years and that was one of the things that you feel so um i don't want to say robbed but i've heard this from many other people because i worked at these agencies with other copywriters of course i wasn't the only one they would all feel that way that you're writing this content that you know is good stuff that you take a lot of pride in and they're going to take it and change it all around a lot of times not for the better and then put their name on it yes and even if you put it on your resume your name isn't on it i have a book right there that i wrote for a marketing agency and i kid you not it's actually on my website where i put it i have an interactive resume and i show it Mm -hmm. my name isn't on it the only way i can tell you i wrote it is there's a memo that the the agency director wrote, good job, David, oh, you did great. (laughs) But you're not getting the credit for that. Right. So it's almost like giving birth in 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 a, a, a more minor, lesser role, but it's this visceral thing from you that you have no credit for, no thank you for. And so I definitely understand that. And when you say you left law school, was it, because of something emotionally or were there other reasons? Because I've always heard about law school being super duper stressful. So I actually didn't, didn't go to law school. I didn't attend law school. I, I studied the LSAT. Um, I had to take it a couple of times mm. end up passing. Um, but my grade for the LSAT itself, the test to get into law school wasn't high enough to get into the uh, local colleges I was in. And so I ended up applying to, some of the law schools down the East Coast. And I got accepted to all of those, but I didn't want to move out of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and so I had to make a decision. 
Um, what am I going to pursue this? Am I going to find something else? Um, and at that time, my grandmother was alive and I lived in Florida for most of my life and I wanted to build that relationship with her. And so I wanted to stay here so I can develop that relationship with her. Yeah. Um, and she ended up passing a few years later, but I was glad I made the decision to stay. Right. right? Um, so the transition occurred after I realized I wasn't going to get into any local schools. And I, and I deliberately set some time aside. I thought about what I wanted to do. Um, it was like a deliberate soul searching yeah. <laughs> thing that I did. Um, I realized I didn't want to write for other people. I realized that the things I didn't like, I could just kind of took them off my list. And I did a few web design uh, projects as a freelance writer. Uh, most of my writing did include like articles and, and blogs and whatnot, but I also did business plans. And so the business writing aspect of it didn't take away from the creative aspect that I love so much. So that kind of, you know, divided the two. Sure. But um, I started getting more clients based off of referrals on those web clients, on web design clients. So it just kind of picked up and I realized I really enjoyed it and just kind of stuck with it. Um, I still stayed as a paralegal uh, in the legal industry, and I just continued to kind of vet out what I didn't want to do, what I liked, what I didn't like, um, and just kind of pursued my interest because I, I, I already had a position that paid well enough and I didn't have to worry about any of my bills or whatnot. So I just kind of took that opportunity to do some deliberate soul searching. Yeah, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Um but it got to a point where my health became an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had to make a very serious decision in, in my career. And I, I suffer from like really bad bouts of like vertigo and dizziness. And it, I think I woke up one day and I went to go brush my teeth and I had fallen over. Uh -huh. And I was like, well, you know what, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. My health comes before yeah. uh, anything else. I went in and I quit and I put in, I resigned the same day. And I didn't mm -hmm. have a plan for how to uh, bring in money, you know, uh, to pay the rest of my bills. And I, but after a while, after about a month or so, um, I began to realize I really enjoyed the freedom that I had and the flexibility that I had. I had no one telling me when to get up. I had no one telling me what to do. Um, I wasn't, you know, working at all at odd hours of the night. Um, and I ended up turning that opportunity around. Um, I, I quit, but four, maybe five months later, I was a contractor for them, but it was underneath my terms. Yeah, and so, it, wor it really worked out for the best. Yes, yes. Um, so I worked for them for, I think, a little over a year or so, and then he, the owner of the company came to me and was like, I, I don't, I don't have any more work for you to do. You, you did it all. I was like, what? Mm. <laughs> I, what do you mean I did it all? But I did, I did everything they asked me to do. And I worked myself right out of a, a contracting position. And so I, I always think that's funny, but. Well, how did that feel for you when that happened? I mean, was there concern? Like, you know, where do I go from here? Not really. I had. I'm a person of varied interests, so I always pursue yeah. the things that I'm, I'm curious about. And so in between that time, in between working as a contractor, because um, I knew at some point it was going to end, and I, I didn't want to put my, my eggs all in one basket with this one contracting position. So I pursued my interests, and that's where um, the real estate came into place. I studied, I took the test, I passed the test, got my license, and... That was a whole different roller coaster, <laughs> completely oh, bananas. Um, but I ended up doing that alongside of the contracting position and met some wonderful people that, you know, I learned a lot during that transition. Um, I learned what I didn't like. <laughs> I learned, um, you know, because it, being a real estate agent is very busy, very, very busy. Um, and I, I realized that type of lifestyle is not something that I enjoyed. I mean, when, when you describe it like that, it almost sounds like trading one type of stress for another. It was. You know, I mean, 
before we started this podcast, you and I were talking, or I probably did most of the yapping, but it, it just seems like so, I think this whole thing with COVID, where so many people are not even convinced yet that it's real, and yet it continues to spread like wildfire, and probably because of that. But it seems like so much of U.S. culture is very confrontational, very in your face, um, us against them, and whatever group it is. And I think a lot of people are getting fatigued from it. And maybe I'm speaking just for myself, but I think there are others who feel that way too. Um, and it just seems like, um, you know, ultimately it's healthier for you to find a middle ground, regardless of what your profession is or your professional interests. So of those different areas, is there one that is most enjoyable for you that you resonate the most with? Or do they all, um, you know, butter your bread as the ex expression goes? Mm. No, um, understand. So in between doing all of that, I also took on web design clients as well. And most of my business was, is uh, still a referral based business. And so everybody that knew me, knew me because of somebody or another. Um, and I, I found that during that time, I enjoyed the time I had with people who had questions about building their business, um, growing their business, marketing strategies, questions, um, you know, just all those business building related items. And that's how it transitioned to being a coach. So what I enjoy most now um, is the business I have built myself around being a business coach. And I still do web design, but I choose projects that mm. I enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I feel like that. I have to be <laughs> honest because, you know, in a lot of ways, I think one of the reasons why I enjoy talking to you is because I see like a lot of parallels. Because mm -hmm. it's like, I went to school originally, my goal was to be a writer. And uh, I grew up reading my heroes over here, Ray Bradbury, mm -hmm. um, is, I mean, I could just go on and on about all these literary icons. And then when I uh, was almost done with college, I was, you know, I had some internships and I looked around. I'm like, these jobs in writing don't pay very well. Uh -huh. And a lot of the newspapers that do have decent paying jobs don't want to let you in unless you have a master's. And I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I could afford it. And um, I always loved the law. I always loved uh, that. My GPA wasn't that good. I didn't want to go to Pat Robertson's uh, law school or whatever it was in Virginia at that time. You may have heard of that. And um, but then, you know, about halfway in, I started studying web design and programming and SEO because I could see, even though it was still very new in the 90s, that this would be a good backup. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated after a few months of kind of floundering around, I realized that working for different agencies could kind of fill in that void, at least some of that void in terms of work. You know, because here I can, okay, I'm a developer, I know SEO, I can write mm -hmm. the content. Um, you know, and and then slowly kind of get more into different roles with digital marketing more broadly so a lot of what you say i can relate to and i think with the coaching depending on the day i could be like gordon ramsay on crack or or i could just be like more like the guy behind me on the wall and just be like i'm half asleep i just i just don't know if i can get excited about this because so much of what you, when you talk to people about coaching, so much of the, the obstacles, and tell me if you disagree, it seems like the biggest, largest obstacles that stand before the entrepreneur in financial success are the ones that they create themselves. Yes, I agree with that. Drama, mm -hmm. family, it's, it's almost never about the money. Yeah. Because... Yeah. I always tell people, you know, look, if you need a root canal, 
you're going to put it on plastic and you're going to pay the couple grand so you're not in pain right if you're not getting enough phone calls and emails and you're not making enough money that's a pain are you willing to pay the same amount of money as you would for root canal or to get your engine fixed to get your business fixed mm -hmm. and there's all this hemming and hawing and back and forth i just don't know what can i get for free on and on and on so part of me really likes the privacy and seclusion mm -hmm. of being a web developer and writing the content and doing the seo and doing the social media and the e-commerce and just being like no right tell shakina all the drama <laughs> and all the fighting and the nepotism and all your fear and everything and let me just do the work and i can be the quiet bookworm or the program right i gravitate toward that there's part of me that wants to put on a blue suit and the blue top hat and the blue cane and my blue jewelry and get up on the stage and give more boot camps and give more seminars which is what i was doing before covid how i would get referrals and how i would do a lot but i don't miss it really part of me does miss it from time to time but 99 percent of my time I'm watching the great courses, I'm reading, I'm studying. I kind of, I don't know. Isn't that weird? No, actually, I don't think it's weird at all. Um, you are, you're doing the things that you enjoy doing. And I think that's what it should be for, you know, for people out there anyway. It, that is really the hard part. Because originally when I started this podcast, it was called Blue Monday. Mm -hmm. And not just because of my fixation on blue. Um, <laughs> although that is bizarre, but it was originally the idea was Blue Monday is a term, I'm sure you've heard it, uh, where people don't want to go to work on Monday. I remember the, the great motivational speaker, Les Brown. I used to listen to him all the time. Absolute favorite. Yeah, uh, I, I love Les Brown, and I know he was married to one of my other heroes, um, Gladys Knight. Mm -hmm. One of my dreams was to go to her Gladys Knight waffles and pancakes in Atlanta. I ain't going now. I love you, Gladys. I love you. Oh my God, I love that voice. But um, one of my, um, oh, what was my point? One of, I, I used to, I forgot what my point was. Let me get back to my list. I'm sorry, Shakina. I died across somewhere in there. Yeah. But but I remember him making some some great point here. You're talking about doing the things that you love and how hard that is. Yeah, one of the points, thank you. One of the points he said was that the the rate of people who get heart attacks on Mondays is like yes. like 70 or 80 percent of people get heart attacks on Monday because the heart is telling them you made me go to this job that I hate mm -hmm. and I want out of this body <laughs> I heard him say that and yeah he said that and the way that he said that I was like he's absolutely correct how many it, people hate Mondays it resonated with me big time because I worked at marketing agencies and I could tell horror stories to you all day long. And I had people coming up to me in tears. I had people coming up about this problem and that problem. Why won't they listen? And I got really tired of it. Mm -hmm. I got really tired of it. I don't miss it. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is I remember having a team manager and they would give you these insane schedules because these projects were due by the end of the week or the deadlines mm -hmm. would come up and they would have these rotating swing shifts i mean what the hell talk about sleepless nights on the procrustean bed to use an archaic <laughs> mythological reference here great title and i one day i just my wife was furious with me because i was exhausted all the time and i couldn't take it one day i just looked at him and i just said you know what I'm tired of pulling your butt out the fire. I've had it. I'm twice your size. And I turned to him and I gave him the, the double jersey salute. And I said, <laughs> have at it. I am gone. I'm out of here. He said, well, what are we going to do? Figure it out. You know, I, I, and I said some expletives. And I, I got in my car and I went home, called my wife. And I just said, oh. I'm coming home. I'm going to order a triple pepperoni pizza <laughs> and watch 
you know, the most mindless stuff I can find tonight. Yeah. I just don't yeah. care. And it was very liberating. Mm -hmm. It does have that effect. It's How have you had to adapt or change during these crazy times to kind of, you know, because you've been in so many different directions. And I want to make sure that I don't tell too many crazy stories on my part. Um, interesting enough, uh, amid the whole COVID thing, uh, I had, my, my lifestyle has not changed much in a lot of aspects. So I work from home anyway. Um, I, I meet clients if I have to meet clients pre COVID, but most of my, most of everything that I do is, uh, from a computer and at home, typically as a web designer, you know, I don't need to be in your office to do that as a business coach and marketing strategist. I don't need to be in the office to do that. A conversation or a video call will do just fine, but, um, it, it hasn't changed that much for me. Admit the whole political issues going on and uprests and, and yeah. writing and stuff yeah. that that has added a, a bit more stress because of just um of everything going on like i, I know because i'm just outside of philadelphia where there are people like rioting uh protesting um some of it's peaceful some of it isn't but mm -hmm. i have to worry about my husband leaving the house right because you, you, like, shouldn't, you shouldn't have I, to. I shouldn't have to right he is i think he's about six one six feet six one um tall black male right. and I, I worry that he leaves the house now <sighs> and i shouldn't have to and so um people who never had to go through that um people who never who don't understand um like there's added stress to that now and it's amazing uh how many people think it's either not a problem not an issue people are just making it up and don't get me wrong there's there's both sides of the swing here right but it's stressful for that, for the political uh, issues going on now is added a, a bit more of an emotional stress to it, but yeah. it hasn't changed my business for the most part because that still is the same, but emotionally it's added a few, few. Yeah. There. Yeah. I know what you mean. I have an app on my phone, the smart news app. Mm -hmm. And um, I was an advisor for about, five or six political campaigns so I can really get into politics and I'm probably very, very transparent. I think everybody I talked to on the planet Earth knows where I stand politically uh, after about two minutes of talking to me. Uh, I don't, I, I think I'm very transparent. I'm sure you already know where I am and everybody listening and watching probably knows where I am politically. Um, it's, it's extremely partisan and it, it's very, very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult. I think, you know, uh, when I talk to people, part of me feels like saying, don't look at the news at all. Yeah. Then there's another part of me that feels like, well, no, you need to know. You need to know. So what I do is I look at the news every couple of days mm -hmm. and nothing changes. Um, you know, I was having this talk with my wife the other day. The irony is everything that went on in the 60s, really nothing has changed at all. The only difference is that there was a law where I think everybody kind of thought, okay, we've made some headway now. Mm -hmm. And we really didn't. Um, so... I mean, do you hear about anything that's going on from your clients? Would you know, you know, from talking to them if you didn't look at the news? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I hear a lot. I, I have friends, friends uh, aside. Um, like awkward discussions with other, you know, with lawyers and like. Yeah, interesting enough. So, um, because I, I, I'm going to call. I don't with, get it, but go, go ahead. Please continue. I'm going to call just... with attorneys at least three to five times a day, right? Based off of these uh, marketing items that I do, these webinars that I do, whatever. Um, and I'm on these calls with them and I hear what they, they say, what's happening all around the world, right? right. So, <laughs> with the COVID, with the rioting and the protests, I, I hear it. It's, it's, in some places, it's not that big of a deal. In other places, it's like, you know, everybody is on the same page. 
somehow and others not so much yeah yeah um but it it definitely tells like even if i didn't watch the news i'm actually on the same kind of schedule you are um Mm -hmm. it was so overwhelming just listening to the news and watching um videos and everything going on that i had i had to stop because it was making me feel like it was too much and like you said in the 60s there was a law but not much has changed. You know, that's yeah. my mother's era, right? Like she, she was born in the sixties and it's like- I was too. Yeah. I and... was too. When I was born, Malcolm X got shot. Mm-hmm. Not on the same day, thank God. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I wouldn't have known anyway because I was being born, but <laughs> it was ex- extremely chaotic. And now it's the same. The difference is where are the, the Malcolms? Where are the, um, the, the, the the kings? I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. Um, based off what I've seen, listened, heard, read, and whatnot, it's hard to find them. Um, that's not causing a, 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 a racial <laughs> division or something. Um, you know, I, I find it, I find it very interesting. Like, I, I don't know. Do you want to hear, do you want to hear something really crazy, a real quick digression here? And, and if it, you, you, I don't know, you're younger than me, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. So I'll preface it with that. <laughs> a long time ago, maybe a year or two ago, I saw Bobby Seal on LinkedIn. Okay. Okay very strong political guy and you know a civil rights hero for a lot of people anyway i saw him on linkedin i looked at his website shouldn't have done it i looked at his website i'm like this is bobby freaking seal Mm -hmm. i sent him an email i said bob i I would love please i'm begging you let me redo your website let me reboot that website make it more responsive I, i would do it a volunteer basis you're this great hero please let me do it he never responded i didn't really expect him to but it was just for like that momentary weakness you know where you see mm-hmm. something and you're like oh my god the geek in me wants to redo that website <laughs> yeah i don't yeah, now i bite my tongue and i just don't do it um what would you say to entrepreneurs and business owners, managers, other paralegals, realtors, lawyers, to help them kind of find their um, equilibrium during what's going on? Interesting. Um, good question. So for those business owners, I, I'd have to say to find to find their balance and everything that's going on, just you know, I don't know. Now's like a really good time to self-evaluate where you are yeah, uh, personally and uh, politically and just kind of redefine or define seriously what your what you believe in. Right? Are the lights flickering where you are? It is not. Did it stop? I okay. I was hoping it was not like some kind of police raid or something. <laughs> I hope not. Okay. Here. It's, it's still doing it. Either that or I'm having a stroke. No, please don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, well, I'm happy to talk to you with blinking lights anyway. It might be an ET. Please continue. And if it is, take me take me to whatever planet you're from. Please continue. So um, define their balance again. I think this is a really good time to find, redefine who you are as a person and your political stance and just how you can just be helpful to one another um in a on a personal side for a business side um i i think what's in what i find important is just just to let me back up so what i'm seeing a lot of uh, business owners doing right now is posting what they believe on online on the websites or or whatnot whatever they believe in right whether it's uh, for one side or the other um which i think is good um 
and, and, and it's always good to stand up for what you believe in, unless, you know, that belief is harming a bunch of other people, right? Yeah. Like, we, I believe in murder. No, you don't. Let's, that's not something you need to believe in, right? Um, I think for that, that balance, you just have to define and what you want and where you're trying to go. Like, because as a small business owner, you are the pulse of the community, right? You, you provide services for people in your community. And you have to understand that without those people, you wouldn't have a business. And so just like try to understand where those clients are coming from and, and make sure you're in alignment with your vision and, and is, is on point. Uh, it's guess. a middle ground. It really yeah. is. It's a, it's a difficult balancing act because uh, I will often volunteer to help nonprofit organizations. And it's always that effort of how much work is this really going to be? How much do you really want to put forth here? Um, how far do you really want to take things? Where do you cut it off? You know what I mean? Like, I'll do this, this, and that. Mm-hmm. But not where do you, how do you put that structure to it? What are the parameters? How do you establish boundaries with that? Do you really want to establish boundaries? Do you want to have to do that if you're volunteering? And when you write blogs for your own website or for social media, you want to express how you feel. But then once it's online, it's there forever. Mm-hmm. Do I really want people to know how I feel about political political issues, for example? Right. When ideally, I'd really prefer to focus in on being a webhead, being a digital marker. I'd rather prefer it be that. But it doesn't mean I'm not interested in these other things, too. Mm-hmm. So it's a balancing act in terms of what you do, how you do it, how you present yourself both uh, online and off. Yeah. Do you ever struggle with that or do you hear about that from lawyers or they, are they oblivious to it? I would imagine realtors would be. Yeah, Sorry, um, realtors, but. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard it from both sides of, of the fence there. So, you know, where, to your point, you know, where do you stop? Where do you stop? Uh, uh, what information do you put out there? Because like you said, it's online forever. Yeah. Um, with an understanding that whatever you put out there is going to affect your business one way or another. If you have an, an, an ideal client or an audience that resonates with your culture, much like Apple products, right? You mm-hmm. ever hear a debate between an Apple product and an Android user? Um, it's, yeah. it's interesting. I have actually on Reddit, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a very strong argument. Um, my husband is an Apple user. I'm an Android user. And every now and again, he's going to try to say that, you know, he feels strongly about this. And I'm like, I don't, I don't care. Tell I just switch to Linux. <laughs> to Linux? Yeah. yeah. Linux Mint. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't need that Apple stuff. Everything's triple the price. Oh, yeah. Um, but the arguments for that is real. It, it depends, like, on how you approach the subject. Like, it's okay to be different. It's okay to feel differently about something or your mm. opinion is different, but everybody shouldn't. I, I just don't believe that. Um, you should be respectful of other people's opinions to a point where it, as long as it's not hurting other people, yeah, yeah, it it's okay. It's okay to have a different opinion. Yeah, I think there's enormous power in being, knowing who you are. Yes. And, and that's really hard. It's really hard because if you talk about brand identity and positioning, mm-hmm. Um, even with politicians, I've had the talks with politicians back when I cared. And it's really hard because to, if they don't know who they are, yes. they know who they should be or who they want to be, but not who they truly are. Yeah. And in politics, when I was being trained in messaging, they always said that whoever had the strongest um, message or the strongest identity would win. Mm -hmm. So the last election we had where that was really prevalent was Obama and McCain. Mm -hmm. McCain's message was macho uh, war veteran and and prisoner. Obama's message was very, very different. 
It was really contrapuntally opposed. And I could see, despite my own personal leanings, I could see that in my mind, he was going to win just on the basis of his messaging being stronger, hip, cool, young, but not the stern father figure that McCain was. Yeah. So anyway. To your point, actually, um, if, if I may. Sure. You mentioned about, you know, knowing who you are, right? And yeah, yeah. I, I always find that the business, the journey of entrepreneurship is just that, is a journey, right? And it's, it's very difficult to know or build a business when you don't know who you are, that that journey is going to it's going to bring it out of you. <laughs> it's going to teach you. It is. It is. Yeah. And, and I think that's why I always said, you know, that with your background, I, I felt like there are parallels like, oh, man, I can relate to her, mm -hmm. you know, and on a daily basis. You know, it's like I was telling my wife, maybe she said, well, she had, she had a webinar uh, going on at five o'clock or whatever. Oh, that's great. I have a podcast at five o'clock. Okay, well, that should be interesting. And so what do you have tomorrow? Oh, I don't have anything going on tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm going to go to that bookcase over there with a million books. Right. And I'm going to decide, is it Ray Bradbury? Is it Philip K. Dick? Is it Cornel West? Um, is it uh, Dr. Asimov? Is it, um, you know, Cahill Gibran? Is it Stephen King? Who am I going to go and pull out my chair? sit out front and scowl at the, the neighbors and the people who walk by and just read for a couple of hours, right? But I I always go back and forth between that. There's like a one part of me that says, come here, you should mm -hmm. be doing this. Forget these people, they can't help you. Mm -hmm. Leave them be. Mm -hmm. You should be doing this. You should be reading these voices from the yeah. past and from the future and listening to them and right. Funny, um, but yeah, like those who from, who have, well, okay, let me back up, sorry. <laughs> but there are people who have this great, great grand idea and they decide that they wanna have a business um, from passion to profit type of a thing. Yeah. And, but they, they love what they're doing. Like if, for example, someone who loves, uh, knitting right um loves knitting knits everything from hats to scarves to to whatever and she wants to make a business out of that but there in order to have a business you gotta have to you build the, re the other parts of the business right there's a yeah. lead generation there's the marketing there there's, there's yeah. a strategy and planning you have to be the visionary of your business and what people struggle with is doing something that they love and making a business out of it because they're not the same. Passion isn't enough to run a business. You still need to know all these other things in order to do it. Yeah. So, um, like typically, I, I recommend people to get an assistant as early as they possibly can. If one, if they can afford it, but only after they've done those items themselves. But so they can focus on their passion and focus yeah. on, you know, doing those things. But um, it's it's hard. <laughs> to make that transition there's things that call to you that say i you know i want to be knitting for the to the next two weeks or so but i don't want to do any of the marketing i don't want to do any of the other things that actually runs your business right it is it's and again it's a whole theme of the, the balancing act you know i mm -hmm. be, because my mother was an english teacher and i went to to college with the goal of being an author, mm -hmm. not really a journalism teacher or an English teacher, although I did do that. My goal was to be an author, but I always felt like you could never earn a decent living at it. Mm -hmm. And my experience proved that to be the case. But that's probably why I still feel so drawn to that. And those are the people who I have the most respect for. If I met Cornel West, I would probably be like, oh, my God, <laughs> can I get my picture taken with you? Mm -hmm. I, I, what am I going to say to you? You know what I mean? It's like I, I would be uh, mute trying to speak to him. I wouldn't know what to do. Um, but I have the most respect 
for that because of the, the effort, the vis, the, you're literally venting your spleen. You're taking all of this out there and putting it onto the page for the world to see. Mm -hmm. And either no one will see it or maybe someone will. You know, I remember George Orwell, nobody knew who he was. He had written many books, but nobody knew who the hell he was until right before he died. Yeah. Right before he died, he just started to make a little trickle of money from Animal Farm, yeah. which was written through pain and anguish to what he had gone through, going through all these experiences where he was being lost and abused and always feeling like this incongruent anachronism in the world the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time the goofy gangly dorky englishman who thinks he's rugged and tough but of course isn't so i remember you know reading his biography and everything being like oh my god you know that was my feeling not like oh this was a great book i just felt like mm -hmm. oh my god this is terrible but i always go back and forth let me get back to talking tech with you because I want to switch it okay. and ask your opinion about marketing. Okay. I mean, I could talk to you all day long, but my biggest issue is digressing because there's so many different things to talk to you about. When you talk about sales conversions and working with business owners and lawyers and service providers, how far do you go with them as far as trying to get them to go across the street with you and saying, I need to help you build your your business first, help you build a business plan first? How far do you have to take them? In other words, do you favor having a structured business plan with them first? Or do you just jump in with specific strategies and approaches or is there a middle ground with that that you do okay so that depends on in what stage of their journey they're at when they come to me so um if they're at the beginning phases of just like from ideation to creation um then that's entirely different if, if there's somebody who already has certain things in place and they're just trying to redevelop their business, that's entirely different as well. So uh, in regards to the business planning aspect of it, um, I, I do tend to, because I, you know, you ask a bunch of questions, right? Like we have to ask a bunch of questions. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm sorry for swinging oh, no, between different not you. topics. No, I mean, not you. I'm sorry. Like when, when a client comes to me as a coach, I ask a ton of questions. You need to. Right. right. And no. so uh, that's what I meant. <laughs> But they come to me, I ask all these questions just to figure out where they are in this journey, because what they say is not necessarily where they are. Yeah. And I have to figure out um, at what stage. So I, I don't really believe in a very long, detailed business plan. I used to write them. So I was like, no, <laughs> for a startup business owner, I don't think you need to have like a 150 page business plan. I, I do think you need a very condensed action plan um, because a, a lot of new owners tend to get into this what i uh, information paralysis they go into information overload they the read Hamlet all the complex yep yeah. yep and they don't do anything about it so what i usually take them through is you know uh, mostly the same stuff so um your services well your services your package your idea your idea making sure it's just viable and profitable um finding your your clients, your target audience, your ideal client, um, services, products, packages. Um, and then we just kind of create those uh, three main systems, the lead generation system, your client service system, and your referral retention system. And so yeah. they're all, most businesses, that's the foundation. And that's that's what I help them create to, to sturdy their foundation, uh, fix those broken pieces where it, it, there is a little leaky or a little squeaky um, and just kind of kind of go for there. But we don't develop a very large plan. Yeah, I think we talked at one point about onboarding, didn't we, a long time ago? We talked about, um, yeah, because your onboarding process is a slightly different. You use a workbook. 
I'm mean. Right. I'm very mean. I'm disorganized and chaotic when I talk to people <laughs> like you for fun. But when I work with a client, I am mean. <laughs> when I was a teacher, they used to say, Mr. S, you're mean. I'm like, no, I'm not. You're not listening. But with clients, I'm mean because I believe that it's like, if I don't have this mm -hmm. funnel, and I'm going to get to funnels with my next question, but if I don't have this funnel, you end up working with abusive clients or having situations where the expectations aren't clear. Okay. And the worst thing is getting involved in a project that doesn't work out. And I'm not going to, I'm determined to never have that again. Okay. And it's always because they're not set up properly to generate sustainable revenue. So our, our job is not so much to give them tools as to say, if I give you the tool, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, is that true? Yeah. Um, it, we ask the, the, the tough questions. Right. So yeah. we have to get them to think about a different perspective. And that's why they come to us. Right. Like if you need heart surgery, you're not going to go to a dentist. <laughs> right. You're, you're going I to hope not. Cardiologist, right. Um, but we, we ask those questions to get them to think thoroughly, strategically about what they want, where they want to be, how they want to get there. Um, because a lot of people just don't. And they and they jump from one thing to another without an, an an actual plan. Yes, it's heartbreaking, and you just um, yeah. You know, I don't remember if I sent you my workbook or not, but you um, did. I did read it. Yeah. Did you like it, or did you just say to hell with this? No, <laughs> no, I looked through it because we had the conversation before mm -hmm. about your your onboarding process is different, where you um, have the workbook and you kind of you know set up that session. And guess what? Every time I don't require it, it blows up. Mm -hmm. It blows up. There, I, there are two nonprofit organizations that I volunteered to help recently through online forums or services. And both of what they did really touched me. I thought it was very moving. I, I wanted to get involved. An orphanage for kids. Mm -hmm. I think it was Nairobi or something. I'm like, oh, my God, how could you not feel for that? Come on. Right? How could you not feel for that? And I said, I'll be happy to, to help you. I'll make you number one in Google for what you want. I'll, I'll help you with e-commerce so you can accept donations. I'll tell you everything you need to know. I'll even help you with your, your banking and everything if you want. But you got to do what I, what I suggest. Mm -hmm. So I think like four or five months went by and I didn't hear from them. So I'm just like, you know what? Hit the bricks. I've had it. And then there was another lady with another nonprofit, same thing. And so every time I don't require that workbook be done, I wish I'd done it. Uh -huh. And you get tired of it. Uh, so speaking about onboarding and being focused, so I am trying to get better on this discussion here. <laughs> How do, what is your opinion? on differentiating sales funnels from lead magnets because you know clients can get stuck on some of this terminology that can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate the two? Do you? And then I have a part two and a part three to that. Okay. Uh, they're two totally different things. Um, your, <laughs> your, your sales funnel is what is a system that you lead your clients through in order to convert them into a paying paying client right it's a yeah. you attract it's a, yeah that's basically what it is your your lead magnet is what attracts them to go through the system in the first place nurture <laughs> i think it's nurture what is it nurture lead i forget yeah what, what the marketer guru guys it's say like awareness, awareness nurture consideration and like purchase or something like that yeah. Well, it's incredible that you remember that. I don't. I've been, you know, but <laughs> the thing is that what makes that so hard to do is that it's different for everybody. Yes. You know, a furniture warehouse is going to have a whole different um, yeah. lead system set up than a lawyer. And that's where most of them you can't even find them online. But go ahead. Yeah, that's where I find um, 
those the conversations that I have with my client um, because they they've done the research right. You can Google anything nowadays, right? So they they found the 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 bullets of wh whatever I said before. Um, awareness consideration yes yes thank you for, for remembering that too <laughs> and they and they go through that and they think it actually applies to them but your sales system depends on your audience uh who you're targeting their yeah. buyer's journey and where you fit on that journey so you can't create a system and until you find out where you fit in that buyer's journey in your client's journey very true um, very true what you and i would create for a law firm with multiple offices is very different than what you would create for yourself or what I would create for myself. Exactly. Or uh, a chef, what mm -hmm. the, the, the chef would create versus a mechanic. So you have to do that diagnostic. Um, so That's let me, I... yeah. So let me, um, how detailed a business plan how detailed should the business plan be, in your view, when you're feeling out those two? For the for the business plan, how detailed should the business plan be? Yeah. I don't think it's going. I don't. We don't create um, again a business plan. We we kind of just pile in an action plan. So in that. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's pretty simple. Um, it is probably it ranges somewhere around ten pages or less usually much, much less. Um, but we go over identifying who your target audience is, your ideal client. Because um, as you know, a lot of people are like, well, I'm targeting um, women entrepreneurs. Or That's everybody. Nice. That's, or everybody. Everybody's not an people answer. People who right? have money. <laughs> right. Um, we identify who your actual target audience is, um, where you can find them, how you can, uh, their, their buyer's journey, because this is a very large part of your marketing. Um, and how you brand or, or target them, how you reach them. So we do we do that. We go over. Um, let me. I'm sorry. Ideal client, <laughs> buyer's journey, your products and services, yes. your packages. We we talk pricing. Um, since I mostly work with online service based businesses anyway, we talk how to package or productize your yes. services. Um, we talk about how to create the content because I deal mostly with digital content, digital marketing, in, inbound marketing. So um, what systems you should apply, uh, that type of thing. And just your, your lead generation, again, those three systems, lead generation, client service, and retention and referral system. Like, and, and creating, and we write out who your referral partners are, right? Uh, yes, yeah, we yeah. used to call it piggybacking. Yep. <laughs> piggybacking yeah. yeah so it's it's not too te too detailed it touches on the important aspects of what your business should you know entail and it has actionable items along with it so you know your schedule what you're going to be doing uh, for the most part on a weekly monthly quarterly basis or what your goals are for those anyway but it's not as detailed as uh, an original a business plan because a lot of startups they don't have financial numbers to put in no <laughs> and they're plan. dangerous they're dangerous yeah. uh because of that and i always say uh, uh i i was a, a a business mentor for score mm -hmm. a division of the u.s small business administration off and on for about 10 years and i i learned very quickly i used to say that these angel investors were little devils because they would take a big chunk out of everything yes. and leave these startup founders with not much left and so if they don't have any capital to put into marketing and education and branding and development then you you're not going to make up that traction mm -hmm. so that leads me i'm um, winding down to a few handful more questions for you. So to what extent do you think mindset is most like the number one problem that business owners face today? Is, is that number one? And I want to hear what you have to say about that first. Um, if I'm understanding correctly, do I think mindset is a problem? Yeah, is that the biggest problem or issue? 
I, I still think it's an information paralysis for the biggest issue for startups. Um, there is some definite mindset challenges, um, like we talked out talked about before. Um, <laughs> the the journey of entrepreneurship is just that it's a journey, and so there's always a roller coaster of effects emotionally um, when you're just starting out as a business owner because there's there's highs and lows, you're, there's inconsistent clients, there's rejection, which yes. you know, I like rejection, so mindset is is part of it is is definitely a challenge um but i also think that again information paralysis too much information not enough execution um but in order to overcome your your mindset or maintain your mindset and your mental health aspect of that yeah. you know there's got to be some sort of routine to get into uh mm. back back to your balance if that makes sense so yeah it does mm-hmm. how do you how, so if you're a business owner or service provider, which I mean, they're basically the same thing. How do you overcome this information paralysis where I want more leads, but I don't want to spend the money. I want to get into online because I know that's where the future is and I should be there, mm-hmm. but I don't know who I can trust. So I'm just going to do nothing. And I think I told you the story about the lawyer that I talked to. I don't remember who I, I've said this story on several podcasts, but it was a, a real emotional roller coaster for me. My wife was diagnosed with cancer and um, I was, I had had a um, consultation scheduled with a lawyer for the same day that I'm taking her in to go and get seen, right? So if I had any hair left, it would have fallen out. I'm sitting in the car and I'm waiting because there, there, she's like, well, you can't come in with me anyway, because A, half the people there don't want to, you know, see you. <laughs> you know, I don't want you to see me. It's just going to be a problem. You just stay in the car and listen to your music or whatever. So I'm like, oh, that's fine. I'll do my consultation while I'm waiting in the car. Mm-hmm. Bad mistake. Because emotionally, I'm all, all over the place. I'm like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? What do I do? So anyway, I call the lawyer. She was a she was a specialist, I guess, in two different areas of the law, so dual practice. And so incredibly, you know, I'm I'm so impressed with that education. So anyway, I call her up and I just say, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. That was a horrible idea. She's asking me all these technical questions about Google and PPC and e-commerce. So anyway, at the end of an hour, she says, I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm just going to do nothing. How, how do you help somebody like that? I would I would try to figure out what their most their three most important goals are. The most urgent pain. Urgent pain, most important goals. Um and just and start from there so if there is let's say i'm I, you know three three issues you know i'm not getting enough clients yeah um you know no one's engaging on my social media uh and i the other one could be whatever else the other one is but i would start what the most important pain points are and just kind of vet them out um because you can't do but so many things in a day anyway and you can't have 20 goals in a month right so we we have to we would have to figure out what's most important right now to get your business moving and flowing just create momentum create movement in a positive direction toward your singular goal yeah i i agree and uh you know if i hadn't i look back on it now because after it was over i was in the moment and I think about a week later, I remember I just said, man, I feel terrible about that conversation, you know. Um, but I had bigger fish to fry, as they say. Mm-hmm. You know, I was more um, focused on something else that mm-hmm. was much more important to me than whether or not this client decides to work with me. I really didn't care mm-hmm. that much. I wanted to help her, but I was distracted in a very big way. 
So um, let's are let me switch over to but tying this up because I have so much fun talking to you. Are there any questions that you may have or any issues that uh, questions you feel I you, I should have asked you that you'd like to touch on? No, I think we covered a lot. <laughs> okay. Any any uh, questions about tools or anything like that that you know I can geek out over and and and, and talk about? What do you use for organizing? I use 17 hats for organizing. 17 hats, that's right. Mm -hmm. And I like uh, Kanban flow. Yes, which I did sign up an account for. I thought that was interesting. I did. Yeah, I like that. For this free account. And so uh, when we talked earlier about it, you had a different column for like ideas for books and uh, yeah. subjects and projects. So I use mine for like... Uh, things I want to do in my business. Because I always, again, I have divided interests a lot of the time, so I have to figure out <laughs> what to do when, what to do what when, um, so I don't get too distracted. But. Yeah, and, and obviously that's a problem I have, um, especially as a podcast host. But yeah, the, the structure and organization really, really does make the difference, especially mm -hmm. when you're either working with clients as the, helping them, or is the business owner mm -hmm. um, outsourcing that work and doing their own work? Um, speaking only from my own experience, without that structure, without those boundaries, mm -hmm. there's too much wiggle room. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true for the business owner. So um, any final thoughts or anything that you would like to interject? Um, I, I guess just touching on a little bit of everything we talked about earlier as a summary. Um, for those just starting out, it's a lot getting started, right? You, you have so many hats that you have to wear, so many things that you have to do, but remember to, you know, start small. Uh, you don't need to be everywhere all at the same time. You don't need to have a post a million times to get a result. Um, social media is an engagement tool, right? Um, you should focus on your foundation first before you decide to conquer the world. <laughs> so, yeah, very true. Uh, just be mindful of, of where you're going. But yeah, one step at a time. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Well, I, I had a blast talking to you. Uh, Shakina, if people want to uh, learn more about your services or hire you as a realtor or a paralegal or a web developer or copywriter, or just get in touch with you, how may they do so? Sure, so um, I'm no longer doing the, the real estate part of it, but for anybody interested in um, startup coaching, business coaching, marketing strategy, they can reach me at jsrvision.com. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter under and LinkedIn under JSR Vision LLC. So everybody can find me there. Okay, well, thank you so much for being on Rebooting Business with me today. I always enjoy talking with you. Thank you so much. And please stick around for another uh, minute or two as I tie up some loose ends. For anyone watching this or listening, thank you for your time. If you have a question or a comment, you can put it in the footnotes below or you can comment. If you're watching this video, please give it a thumb up, thumbs up and consider subscribing. Um, if you're listening to this on podcast format, you can actually submit a question to be featured on an episode of the podcast by going to anchor.fm slash rebooting business slash message. Pretty sure that's right. And it'll be in the footer notes as well. So uh, thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Stay sane. And uh, listen to some more of my great podcasts, okay? Take care, everybody, and we're going to tie it up. You've been listening to Rebooting Business, the podcast for, about, and by America's small business owners who are ready to reboot and rebuild businesses in a post-COVID-19 world. To learn more about rebooting your business or be a guest on the podcast, please visit www.dms.blue today.